Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is July 14th, 2015, and my guest is Wences Casares, founder and CEO of Zappo. That's X-A-P-O, a company that creates Bitcoin wallets and vaults. Wences, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you, Russ. Thank you for having me. So let's start with your story. Uh, how did you come to be an evangelist for Bitcoin? I first learned about Bitcoin in 2011. Um, I live in California, in Palo Alto, and a group of childhood friends uh, from Argentina um, were doing a project together and we all needed to send money for that project. And I couldn't send money from California to Argentina. So I was trying to see if my sister who's there could give my friend some money and I'd pay her later. And one of my friends who's not tech savvy or financially savvy said, hey, why don't you use Bitcoin? And I said, what? Bit what? And he said, oh, I read about it. It's a digital currency that you can send money very easily. So I was curious and I looked up online and I think in Craigslist I found someone who was willing to meet with me at the cafe in Palo Alto and gave me some Bitcoin and I gave them the cash. And then I, I just got the Bitcoin in my cell phone and I sent them to my friend in Argentina and the next day he had sold them for pesos. And I just couldn't believe what happened. Uh, I was very skeptical at first, but because of what I just saw happen, I began to research it. And the more I learned about it, the more I was fascinated by it. And I felt like I was witnessing the beginning of the Internet, just that kind of fascination. So like, wow. This, when you saw the internet at the beginning, you got that sense that it was going to change the world forever. I think that, that Bitcoin is going to change the world more than the internet did. And what year was that? 2011. 2011. And what were you doing? What had you been doing with your life up till then? I've always been a technology entrepreneur in finance. Um, I'm originally from Patagonia, a southern part of Argentina. I've seen my family lose everything to economic disaster many times. Yeah, more um, than once. Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. yes. And uh, I did um, an, uh, the largest online brokerage in Latin America. I did a, a bank for the underbanked in Brazil, an online bank in Europe. And I was working at the time in a boy wallet here in, in Silicon Valley when I ran into Bitcoin. So that was four years ago. Yeah. So why, when you said you were at the start of something revolutionary, world changing, what about it then and what about it now is important? Obviously... You made a transaction that was would have been very difficult to make. So that's one use of Bitcoin is to yeah. send money across international borders. But why do you think it's so important? Um, people make Bitcoin more complicated than it is. And it's quite simple, actually. There are only three things that matter about Bitcoin and that make it revolutionary. Those three things are, number one, nobody controls Bitcoin. Not Russ, not Wences, not any one person, not any group of people, not one company and not one country. It is a thing, right? And it's, it's open for everybody to use it, but nobody can change it or alter it in any way. Nobody owns it. And it's completely distributed. And that's incredibly powerful and much, much harder to accomplish than it seems. And that's very unique to Bitcoin. Um, that's number one. Number two is that there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin up until now. Whenever we had a form of money, there was no way to know that it was really scarce. The most, um, and if it's not really scarce, it doesn't hold value. So in terms of the capacity to hold value, the best form of money we've seen in 5,000 years, it's gold. Because it's really scarce, because it's very hard to mine, and we mine very little, 2% a year, right? Uh, so it holds value better than any other currency we've seen. But we still mine 2% a year, whereas with Bitcoin, there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin. That's unique. We've never seen anything like that in the history of money. And, and that's the result of the technology and the way it's been created. That connects with number one, which is, it's not up to you or to me or to anyone. Nobody can change 21 million, right? And that's really, really powerful. It's the combination. It's, there will never be more than 21 million, and we don't need to trust anybody. It's mathematics. And the third and last point that make Bitcoin... Um, unique is that if I own some Bitcoin, I am free to send those Bitcoin to anybody anywhere in the world in real time and for free. 
And that, up until now, it was impossible. If I wanted to send money to someone, we both needed to trust some third party, a bank, a settlement house, a clearing house, Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, someone we both have to trust. And those were usually inefficient and expensive, and it took time. And now, just like it happened with the internet, it's happening to money that I can send that value to anybody, anywhere in the world in real time for free. So when you combine those three things, that is, it, nobody controls it. It's the most scarce we've ever seen, and it's the most freely transferable we've ever seen. It's the best form of money we have ever seen. It may take 10 or 20 years to get established, but it's going to change money like the internet change information. And it's going to have for 5 billion people probably more impact than the internet did. Why? Why is that important for those 5 billion people? Because if you are one of the 5 billion people who there's, that lives on cash, there's a little over a billion people who have credit cards and debit cards, right? Most of the world does not have that. And so they see the digital revolution go by them. They cannot benefit in any way of that. And they have to rely on cash. Cash is expensive to keep at home. It's expensive to transport. It's risky. All payments need that you move there physically, usually by public transportation that is slow, increasing the risks of it being stolen. It's ridiculous, but it's very expensive to be poor and to, it's very expensive to live on cash. And then when there are problems with the currency, like I saw growing up in Argentina, the poor get... Um, the worst end of that trade, right? The rich can move their assets somewhere, but the poor can't. So Bitcoin changes all of that. So now anybody with a little bit of cash can, all you need is a cell phone. Anybody with a cell phone can get some Bitcoin and participate in the digital economy and um, have an alternative to the local currency if they don't trust it. So both of those things are incredible. If you ask an average person in Africa, a farmer in Africa or a, or a, or a, a, a person in Asia, who ha does not have access to a bank account, what do you prefer? Perfect access to information or perfect access to money? They would prefer perfect access to money. It's more important. Right. To sure. Them. It's nice to be able to look up, say, how far Jupiter is from the United States, but that's, I mean, from the Earth, but that's not so crucial if you're yeah. a subsistence farmer or a small business person in That assumes Ghana. that you have your basics, shelter, food, health, education covered, then it's great to see how far Jupiter yeah. is, right? <laughs> but if we don't have those covered, I prefer to cover those first. Correct. And there's lots of people in that in yeah. that group. So let's talk a little bit about the technical side. We've talked about this before on EconTalk. Uh, it remains somewhat mysterious to me, although I think we made some progress uh, when we talked to Nathaniel Popper. And Wences is one of the stars of that book. It's how I found out about you, was, uh, was in Nathaniel's book. It was a very, he, he has a lot of... Um, Intriguing people in book, you were one of them. The, the technical side is, is hard for a, a non-technical person to understand. The way I understand it, you, you correct me and steer me. So if I want, I'm going to send you Bitcoin. Um, how, how does that happen in terms of uh, what, has to what is actually taking place when I do that? I have to tell me. So I was going to um, actually, I was going to try, decide I'm going to let you try. <laughs> all Bitcoins in existence are like a snail in that I could never just show you a snail. I'll show you a snail in its shell. All snails live in a shell, right? right? All Bitcoins live in a Bitcoin address. I cannot show you a Bitcoin that is not attached to a Bitcoin address by definition. Right? So it's like a snail with a shell. You have a Bitcoin attached to a Bitcoin address. So if you have some Bitcoin, by definition, they live in some Bitcoin address. And what makes that Bitcoin address yours is that you have a key that gives you the right to unlock those Bitcoin. And the only people who can, the only person who can use those Bitcoin is the one that has the key to that particular address. So you have a Bitcoin address that has two Bitcoin, and you want to send one of those Bitcoins to Alice. So what you do is you put together a transaction that says, from this address, I want to send that has, from this address that has two Bitcoin, I want to send one of those Bitcoin to this other address. And to do that, you sign that transaction. Imagine like you are stamping it with a private key. Which is and my okay to give okay. Alice access to my one Bitcoin. Yeah. And whenever someone, and that transaction gets broadcasted to all of the Bitcoin system, and anybody that picks that transaction up can see that this address had two Bitcoin, that the owner of that address wants to transfer one Bitcoin to this address, and that seal, that stamp of approval that you did with the private key, shows everybody that you actually own the private key to that address without them needing to see what it is. The, the key. So imagine 
a, a stamp where people get to see the stamp, but not the how do you call the thing that you do stamps with? The, I don't know. It's a good question. But the stamper. It's like it's like a fingerprint, though. It's the it's equivalent like of me saying. Yeah, they see the I fingerprint, but not the not not the finger, right? right? And they say, and with that, they can see. Okay, this person really has the private key without needing to see the private key itself. Yeah. And then the transaction. Um, there are many other transactions like that, and every ten minutes, all of those transactions get grouped in a block, and a block of transactions that have been verified gets added to the blockchain. Yeah, which is the record of all transactions that have ever taken place from exactly. the beginning. So how does that get verified? Let's go to that step. So, so there are so lots of people around the world, lots of servers around the world that are grabbing all of those transactions, group them, them neatly in a, in a block, and running all the processes to verify that that address really has the two Bitcoin that you say you have, that that signature is really a, the right signature that was generated with a proper private key. And um, it's running a number of verifications. Basically, these are the people where the Bitcoin muscle is to really make sure that those Bitcoin haven't been spent before, etc., etc. And if one of those people will get to put the next block, there's a block added every 10 minutes containing all the transactions of the last minute. Whoever gets to validate and insert that next block gets a reward for doing that. That's how they mine the next set of Bitcoin. Yeah, that reward right now is 25 Bitcoin, 25 Bitcoin every 10 minutes. That's a lot of money right now. Bitcoin's worth about, I just saw, $292, is yeah. that correct? Yeah. So if I can verify that, I'm going to make 25 times 292? Yeah. That's, that's a lot of money. So how hard is it to do? So a lot of people thought what you just thought, and they want to do it. So the way it is done is who gets to add the next block, and therefore who gets the 25 Bitcoin? Is decided by a lottery. So you want to buy tickets to the lottery. And the only way to buy the tickets to the lottery are issued against processing power. You have one processing power, you get one ticket. You have two processing power, you get two tickets. You have five, you get five tickets, right? So the more processing power the I more bring to the, the higher my chances of winning the 25. Exactly. Which was brilliant Why? On, on Satoshi's. On, it was a brilliant design to ensure that there's as much processing power at Bitcoin's disposal. So when, when you say processing power, how, how do I, should I think about that? that the, the, so here's my, my Mac Air that's sitting here on the table between us. Uh, it doesn't have much processing power, I assume. If you get all the Mac Airs in the world, and all of the laptops in the world, and all of the desktops in the world, all of the computers in the world, and you put them to mine Bitcoin, they will not mine as much. They won't have as much processing power as the current Bitcoin miner. That's how much Bitcoin <laughs> processing power there is. So what does that mean then to say that they have a lot of processing power? Is it the speed at which they can verify? Is it Basically, the most important thing that it means is that it's trustless. If it was just one computer doing it, um, you and I could put two computers and take over the system. Right now, if someone wants to take over the system, they need to put a lot of processing power. Maybe a government can do that, but it's very hard for a person or a company to do it. Now. That's why it's trustless, because there's way too much processing power. But, but is it, when you say processing power, what's the metric? Uh, hashes per second. Which per second? Hash, hashes per second. So what is a hash? It's how quickly you can sort of do a mathematical function in a second. How many times can you okay, do Okay, so, so it's... Processing power. Processing the power. ability to do a complex uh, calculation at high speed where high speed can't really even be talked about. It's, yeah. Yeah. Basically, the easy way to think about it is there's a lottery going on every 10 minutes and people can buy tickets to the lottery and a lot of people are buying tickets and you need to you give processing power, you get a ticket. Right. So you said that was a brilliant idea by the mythical but... Uh, Real Satoshi Nakamoto, the, the creator of the, the um, software that makes this happen. It, it's brilliant because it gives people an incentive to put processing power into the system and because it's, it's also very competitive. Is that the there are many, many There are many other things that Satoshi did that are brilliant. This is one of them. And this is brilliant in many different ways. This one thing that he did is brilliant in many ways. But one way in which it's brilliant is in which it's a mechanism by which you almost guarantee that there will be processing power serving Bitcoin. Bitcoin is not served by Google or by Amazon or by a government. It's not in one server totally somewhere. Decentralized. It's completely decentralized. How do we know that there will be enough, enough. people doing yeah. that? Well, that incentive 
proved to be enough and we have hundreds of thousands. That was brilliant. Genius. Yeah. Another, another part in which is brilliant is if you and I came up with Rascoin and we're going to launch it in Monday, one of the first decisions we have to make is how many Rascoin are there going to be on day one out there, outstanding. Let's say there's $100 worth of Rascoin. It, it cannot accommodate a $1,000 transaction, our whole ecosystem. So... <laughs> How many there are out there is quite important. So we say, look, there's about $3 billion worth of Bitcoin, so we're going to launch on Monday with $3 billion worth of outstanding rascal. Okay, the next important thing we have to answer is who are, who's going to own those $3 billion? Yeah, where we one? start, yeah. So it's like half an, a billion and a half for Russ and a billion and a half for Wences. And people don't buy that, right? Not so so we have to allocate it over time with some process. And... But then what happens is most people say, you know what, I'm going to buy once it has been allocated, distributed. It's a, it's a chicken and egg problem. And bit, this mining process was a brilliant process to allocate it over time, but in exchange widely. for something that was very useful to the network and very widely distributed. So that was very, very powerful. Yeah, that's, uh, that's extraordinarily clever. Extraordinarily so, clever. And people don't realize how hard it is to replicate. It's like, can't someone come with a better Bitcoin? It's, Look, Bitcoin has life. What I mean by life is Bitcoin is something that has zero intrinsic value. You say zero. Zero. Right, right correct. No intrinsic value whatsoever. But now we have collectively determined that it has some value that is non-zero. Right now it's 292, but it, it goes up and down, right? The, the value of Bitcoin is not technical, it's not... Financial is not regulatory, it's magical. It's just people deciding that something has value. Correct. And it's completely arbitrary and completely subjective. So you have lots of different currencies and experiments that are pre, that in which everything is very nice, but they don't have a value. They're, they haven't gotten to a point where there's a social consensus that they are worth something. Imagine the earth for billions of dollars, for billions of years, didn't have life. And there is a period of, imagine three seconds, in which in one second one is the Earth without life, second two something happens, and second three is Earth with, with life. That's magic. And yeah. it happened. We are still trying to figure out how, and there are many theories, yeah. but it happened. It was yeah. Earth without life, and then there's Earth with life. So was Bitcoin without life from January 2009 to late 2010. It was Bitcoin. It was one more experiment was, without life. It, it was a the theoretical paper that it was an more. idea. And it had, no, no, but it was issued in 2009. And right, it was existed. It existed. It was around, but it was like monopoly money. It was free. It didn't have. And then at some point at the end of 2011, it, some magic happened and it had value and it had life. That is incredibly hard. No, that's a hard part of one of the hardest things about a real currency, which Bitcoin has and most other currencies don't have, right? or cryptocurrencies don't have. Right, because people, it, it crossed that boundary, you're saying, yeah. which might not have happened, but yeah. it did. And once it did, it suddenly people are investing millions of dollars yeah. into maybe and doing you, something with it. And you cannot, and it's not one of, just like we don't know how to create life from scratch. Uh, it's not something that we can recreate technically or financially. It's, just, it's a little magic that has to happen, right? Yeah, as we say in, in economics, it's, it's, an, it's emergent. It is uh, complex. We just have recently been talking about the fact that uh, it's hard to create a prairie. We, we know what a prairie has in it, so, uh, <laughs> but, but that's not enough, yeah. right? Like you say, we know what a successful currency has. You trust it. It's portable, um, it's lightweight, it's, it's divisible. Right, it's divisible, and uh, so, so it should be easy, but it's not, because there's a certain set of, as you say, magic, or, um, a sequence of things that have to happen, and we don't fully understand the process, so we can't fully create it from scratch. Uh, it's, that's a beautiful, a beautiful idea. So First, let's go, go ahead. Uh, any form of currency performs two functions, two very different different functions. Currencies are used for saving and currencies are used for paying. Store of value and transactions. Yeah. Um, I was trying to say it in a less that's academic fine. way, but you're, that's a pro, the terms you I'm just, I'm just proper. But I, yeah. I have a handful of yeah. you know, over-educated listeners. I, for them, I wanted to, in case they couldn't understand the everyday language. <laughs> so the, if you look at all currencies that have ever existed and you compare the capacity to save, to store value, nothing beats gold. And nothing beats gold, not by a little, but by orders of magnitude. 
And the second thing, that it, the second best thing at storing value after gold is land. And it's really a very, very far second because land has carrying costs and taxes and various... And, and, the, and if the, you have to leave the country, you yeah, can't take it with yeah, you. Yeah, and, 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 and the, 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 the value of it changes dramatically with geopolitical changes. And so gold has been... And, and if you compare gold versus the any currency that has ever existed, it's a brutal uh, comparison. Gold is, has been much better at storing value. And the only reason why that's the case is because gold is more scarce than any other of these. And you compare Bitcoin to gold in terms of scarcity, and it's hard to say how much gold there is above ground. It's even harder to predict how much will be mined over the next 10 years. But in the case of Bitcoin, you can count and there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin. So as a store of value, Bitcoin will be much, much superior, orders of magnitude superior than gold. I know that today is very volatile, but just in theory, it's the only thing... Gold you, is also volatile, not necessarily yeah. historically, but it has its own challenges. But if you have a little bit of gold, every year you have a, little, a smaller percentage of the total because there's more and more gold being mined. You have a little bit of dollars, every day you have a little bit less of the total because more and more is being printed. And if you have a peso every hour, you yeah, have, you have to a peso year every, day. <laughs> every hour you have... With Bitcoin, if you whatever percentage of 21 million Bitcoins you have today will be the same percentage 300 years from now. That's, we cannot say that of anything else that I know. And that's why, as a store of value, Bitcoin will be much superior than anything we've seen before. And in terms of payment, the best form of payment that we've seen to this day, the most universally accepted, is a dollar bill. There's billions of people around the world who will have no problem accepting a dollar bill. But the problem is that I have to have a dollar bill and give it to them physically. If, if we, I don't have that, you know, there's billions of people who will accept that. But there's only 30 million merchants who will accept credit cards, and there's even less people who will accept PayPal. So, and even fewer who can have those. Yeah, so, so we have never seen something like Bitcoin before where we have billions of people, anybody with a cell phone, who can accept it, and we can move it easily. So, and you put those two together... And it's by far the best form of money we've ever seen. Now, there's some problems with it. We're going we're gonna to get to those in, in a little bit. But uh, I wanted to ask you something um, about the, uh, the store of value, which is, I want to come back to your magic point. When people say, uh, oh, you know, Bitcoin, well, it doesn't have any intrinsic value. It's not like gold. I said, well, really, gold doesn't have any intrinsic value either. Yes, you can use it for your in dentistry. It's nice for jewelry, but it's it's really a social convention that gold is something that we decided, which yeah. of course we didn't. There was no we and there's no decide. There's no group that sat around and said, wouldn't it be great if one of the really scarce metals that's hard to get out of the ground was used? It became, it could have been silver, it could have, but gold's better. A little bit better, I guess. I'm not quite sure why, but it's, it's a little more harder to get out of the ground, to scarcer. Uh, it could have been, you know, it's like when somebody says... Uh, uh, it's not like diamonds. Diamonds are really totally a social convention. Their main use is I can get engaged to my, you know, to my wife to be that way. But why is why do we decide that a diamond? Once that happens, once that magic becomes in place, it's very powerful. And so Bitcoin has crossed perhaps the the boundary into a store of value potentially. Question is, can it maintain that if it's not used in transactions? And, I absolutely think that. It can. Look, um, all gold above ground is worth about $8 trillion, and nobody accepts gold for anything. <laughs> it's, right? it's purely a store of value. So, right, it's a total social yeah. convention. So, and, yeah. and in the case of Bitcoin, it's so liquid that it will be impossible to contain it to just a store of value. Now, because there's only 13 million people out of 7 billion who own it. 13 it, million out of 7 billion have yeah. some Bitcoin. Yeah. It's a pretty big number, actually. It's a tiny. It's a very small number, but it's kind of a big number. If you'd asked me to guess, I wouldn't have said it was 13 million. Yeah, there's more people playing Angry Birds every hour. Than oh, well, that's it. Yeah, well, that's so, it. Of course. Uh, <laughs> so there's 300 million people playing Clash of Clans. So no, it's a small number. Uh, and, and while the man, number is small, it makes a lot more sense as a store of value than it does as a payment mechanism. But once we get to 200 million people owning Bitcoin, which would be more people owning Bitcoin than have PayPal accounts, then there's no way you can prevent those people to use it as a payment mechanism because it's the most liquid instrument it's they easy have. for them. Yeah. yeah. So Bitcoin, I see a lot 
in America, especially, and in Europe to a lesser degree, where people are too focused on Bitcoin as a payment mechanism because they don't understand or care for the store of value. Because we have a good one already. Because you have a good one already. But Bitcoin is developing the other way around. It's first a good, great store of value, and then eventually it will be a great way. And as you point out, if you're in a place in the world where your currency has been debased repeatedly yeah. and cannot be trusted, you can't count on the fact that it won't happen again, then you're going to be very attracted to it. Yeah. And yet many of those places are the places that have the least capacity to enjoy it. They have yeah. the least internet access. They have right the places that, quote, need it the most, the pay places that really could use a good store of value that have, say, insecure governments or governments that can't be trusted or exploitive governments, they're also may, may be less likely to have access to the Internet than in... No, but that's changing really fast. And every it's a, day. It's a parallel track. It has nothing to do with Bitcoin, but, but, but you know, I don't know if it's going to take five years or ten years, but I could bet confidently that we're going to end up with seven billion people with smartphones. It's irreversible. And they're all going to have right. access to the Internet, and once they have that, they have all, all they need to get a Bitcoin and... So let's talk about some of the problems, and that'll be our segue into Zappo and what, what you're working on to try to, to, to solve some of those problems. And again, we'll also highlight some of the technology. So um, my key to my address is an actual s string of yeah. letters and numbers that's generated, I assume, randomly by yeah. how? Uh, when you... If I don't use Zappo, which I used yesterday, so I signed up for a wallet. We'll talk about that when we get to Zappo, your company. I'm just a technology guy, though. I'm not interested in a wall, a Zappo thing. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm out there right now. I'm listening to this. I'm gonna get some. I want to have some Bitcoin. You can create what do I using do? an algorithm. You can create a pair, which is a Bitcoin address plus its private key, uh, without asking anybody's permission. How do you do that? Um, there is a there is an algorithm that you have to use to make it compatible with Bitcoin. And How do I find out about that? It's in the founding documents yes, of Bitcoin? Yes, it, it's, it's somewhat technical, but all the information is online for you to be able to. Okay, so I do that. I now have my 64-digit so, key. You mentioned uh, Digital Gold, the book by Nathaniel yeah. Popper. I think that of all the things I read, that book does the best job at explaining Bitcoin in a, I agree. In a very clear way, very entertaining way. And in the... Appendix, it has a great explanation of these more technical issues that sometimes confound, confound people, but, but they shouldn't. It's, it's simpler than it seems. Okay, so I've got my 64-digit key. Yeah. And I go out and I paint your house, and you say you did a great job. We agreed it's 100 Bitcoin, and I'm sending to you. Uh, I'm going to send them to you. And um, I take them in return for the painting, and I now have 100 Bitcoin in my account. Yeah. Um, to be clear, for you to receive the Bitcoin, you didn't need to use to do anything or to use a private key. That that the sender it's up to you. Do that, okay, but you, but you have to just know my shell, my address, my home. Your, your shell, yes. So your, your, I tell you that, and you send it to me. It's public information. It's you know, it's all in the blockchain. No, I mean, it's all all the addresses are in the blockchain, and you can very safely broadcast to anybody you want the public Bitcoin address. There's no no harm in that, right? But nobody knows if I tip. Well, let me ask a clarifying question about anonymity first nobody knows my address unless i tell them correct correct yeah um nobody can read the blockchain and know where wences casaris's house is correct it's all anonymous correct 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 it's not anonymous i would say it's pseudonymous because anonymous it's what? pseudonymous because anonymous would be that you don't know anything correct and actually someone will go to the blockchain and will see that one address that belongs to me, but they don't know that. But they will see that one address gave another address 100 Bitcoin. That's all they will see. They don't know that one address is Wences. They won't know that the other address is Russ. Anonymous would be that they cannot see any of this, right? Correct. But here, the, the, there are handles and identifiers for both of them. And, um, and you can, it's not written there in the blockchain who is each one of them. But, but when I ask you for 100, yeah. From now on, you know my, you know Russ Roberts's address. Now I could have, I could have painted your house wearing a mask. Yeah. And you literally wouldn't know who I was. We could have transacted for something over the internet, and we would be literally anonymous. Yeah. But we're, it, we're not anonymous in the story that I'm telling exactly yeah. because now you know yeah. Russ Roberts's address. So you sent me my hundred Bitcoin, and now I decide I want to use it. I want to give it to somebody else, or I want to. So I need to use my private key. And I forget it. I can't remember it. Gone, right? Can't get that hundred back yeah, ever. No. So there's some Bitcoin 
we're going to actually end up with less than 21 million Bitcoin because in in in, in correct in circulation because some will be dissipated no. through. God forbid, I'm run over by a car. Then there's no estate to be. Yep. It's gone, totally gone. So what's the? I need a backup, probably, right? So what do I do? At the very least. So right so, now, I can write it down on a little piece of paper. That means if somebody breaks into my house and gets my little piece of paper, they can steal all my Bitcoin. This would be the equivalent of you keeping all your savings at home. Correct. And some people may be wired to do that, but most people, it would be bad advice to advise them to do that. Correct. Right? Because no matter where you keep them, there's risk. And you say, okay, I'm going to keep them underground and, okay, you're in a safe. And safe deposit safe. box in a vault. But most people rather let a third party do that. Correct. For them. So unless you really know what you're doing, safekeeping private keys is tricky because, um, because people can break and into them because you can lose them, because they can be stolen, because you can lose them. So... Um, I, so let's talk about the stealing for a minute. Yeah. What a lot of people do with their passwords. Yeah. Uh, if you're my father, you write it. He's 85. You, you write it down on a piece of paper, which yeah. is not ideal. Maybe, maybe it's better, though, than what other people do. What he also does is he writes it in his computer. Yeah. Uh, if you put it in your computer, you make it hackable, correct? Once yeah, you get on the internet. What we have to understand is that this is the first time ever in the history of computers that you have a digital piece of information, 64 characters that are worth money. Correct. It is money. Yes. Before. It's a wallet. It's like finding a cash wallet in the like street. It's like finding cash yeah. digitally, right? And, and this is a concept that is hard to understand, but it is cash. And before, since there was no digital cash, it was just something pointing to cash that was somewhere else, right? I was looking at a mirror. You were not, never really looking at the real cash. Um, you're pointing out that the cash was in some bank or in PayPal or a credit card, but it was never the real cash. This is the real cash. So there's a lot of incentives for people, for bad people, to go and get those codes because they can run away with the cash. So you have to really protect them. And the way I protect my, the way I protect my credit, my passwords, is I have codes in, in my, on my computer that remind me of the things. Uh, so, for example, uh, if... If my password was Wences, I wouldn't put Wences. I would put uh, the guy on Woodside. We were on Woodside Road in California right now recording this. And that would remind me that it was you. I might, I might try your last name first. I might have to poke around a little bit. Uh, but eventually I could remember it. But when I have the 64-digit number, I can't really create yeah. that kind. You could. There are people who can remember 64 digits. They have schemes to help them do it. But So one of the challenges of Bitcoin is, is securing that yeah. That key. Now, uh, we haven't been so good at that so far. Uh, so talk about Mt. Gox. What went wrong there? What did they do incorrectly uh, that allowed uh, people to lose all their money basically overnight? Mt. Gox was a company that provided Bitcoin services. Uh, in the Mt. Gox uh, story, there was nothing wrong with Bitcoin itself. Uh, it was the things that went wrong went wrong because Mt. Gox did them wrong. We don't yet know if it was a case of uh, theft, where some third party stole the Bitcoin from them, or fraud, where they, yeah. we don't know. Um, it doesn't really matter, uh, but it would be nice to know. But basically, they lost uh, almost a million Bitcoin of their customers. And... And they're lost for good, forever, because they didn't do a good job at protecting those private keys. Right? And, um, and I think it created an immense awareness about how important it is to really put a lot of effort into how the private keys are protected. And, and customers mistakenly trusted Mt. Gox with those private keys, essentially, yeah. in establishing the equivalent of, say, a brokerage account, which Correct. gave people access to move money in and out, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, one question before I forget, I've just always wondered, um, if I'm going to buy something from you via Bitcoin, I'm one of these people with the smartphones who's going to change the world, right? And I need to, let's just use Amazon as an example. Amazon does not take Bitcoin yet, uh, but let's say they did. And so I get on Amazon and I order the mm -hmm. item 
and I push a button which says I give Amazon permission. I want to send 100 Bitcoin to Amazon, and then they don't send me the item. They, yep. they get the deal. They get the coins because once it's gone, it's gone. It's over, but they don't, get, they don't give me the item. What's my recourse? Um, you have full recourse. It doesn't matter how you pay, right? It's Amazon, and they will honor it. It's like if I go to Target and I buy something with cash, and um, I get home and that is defective or somehow I'm not happy with it, I just go back to Target and they will give me a new one or refund me. Correct. It's exactly the same. But in the case of, say, I will each, let me take eBay, where I'm using a third party such as PayPal or Visa to make my payment, I go to Visa and I say, hey, this guy, it's just a person, it's not a, a merchant with a, a brand and a reputation, doesn't... This person doesn't care that, in fact, the person's anonymous. It's going to run away and not pay a price for this. So I go to PayPal and I say that person never sent the, the item or yeah. eBay. In this case, you cannot do that with Bitcoin. It's like paying with cash. It's, it's like going, meeting a guy in a street corner. I pay him the cash and he disappears and he tells me where he lives. But when I show up at the house, there's nothing there. Yeah. But that's why you will buy at places that you trust, like Amazon, or if you are doing this in a marketplace, you're going to look at the reviews of the person who's sending and say if he has good reviews and people are not complaining, you're not going to have a problem. Because one of the fascinating things to me about Silk Road, which was the uh, online marketplace that involved a lot of illegal activity, people trusted people who were doing things that were legal where you couldn't go to the police and say, or the court and say, this guy didn't give... But, but I guess it emerged. Some kind of reputational mechanism was used on there to, mm -hmm. to make that happen. Um, one last technical thing, and then we're, I think we're going to move to Zappo. There's different denominations of Bitcoin. I didn't realize this until recently. So when I signed up for Zappo, I got a gift or a starting amount in my wallet of uh, 50 bits. bits. How much is a bit? A bit is, there's a million bits in a, in a Bitcoin. So I got one millionth of a Bitcoin. There's another term, a Satoshi. Is this a real thing? Yes. A hundred so, millionth of a Bitcoin? So, yes, that's the smallest unit. Uh, so uh, one bit is 100 Satoshis. And we like bits because they are like dollars. Uh, they have two decimals. Uh -huh. right? <laughs> because you have one bit, comma, zero, zero, because 100 bits are one Satoshi. Uh -huh. one, 100 Satoshis are one bit. So. And, that's the, and that right now is the minimum? Yeah. Could somebody change that? That could be changed. With through, a, through How would that be changed? A convention, agreement. Uh -huh. You're not really changing the value in that case, right? You're no, it's just, just a counting mechanism, accounting, right? Yeah. It's just a, um, but I think some people misunderstand, which I found fascinating um, as an economist. They say, well, if there are only 21 million, we're going to need more than that. The answer is you don't. No. Explain why. You don't because there's actually 21 million bitcoins, but there's... 21 trillion <laughs> satoshis, right? So, and if you needed more, you could yeah. make it to I believe that. I believe that there is a non-trivial chance that Bitcoin fails. I may be the most bi biased Bitcoin guy you can find, pro Bitcoin guy you can find, and even then, I think there's a non-trivial chance, maybe more than 20 percent, that Bitcoin fails. In which case, its value will go to zero. So nobody should own any amount of Bitcoin they cannot afford to lose because it can go to zero. So it's very, very risky to own an amount of Bitcoin you cannot afford to lose because you, it is incredibly volatile. It will remain incredibly volatile for many years and there is a non-trivial chance that it goes to zero. I happen to believe that there's more than 50% chance that Bitcoin succeeds. And if Bitcoin succeeds, I believe that a Bitcoin is going to be worth more than a million dollars. So I believe that sometime in the next 10 years, one Bitcoin is going to be worth more than a million dollars. So just like it would be very, very irresponsible to own an amount of Bitcoin that you cannot afford to lose, it would also be silly not to own a little bit of Bitcoin, to put no more than 1% of your savings in Bitcoin. Because if I am wrong, your downside is capped at 1% and it shouldn't hurt you very much. And so let's say that you have, I don't know, let's say that your savings are $100,000. So what I would say is you should have $1,000 in Bitcoin, right? Because if... Uh, that's which, four Bitcoins, roughly. That's four Bitcoins, roughly. At current if, price. If I am 
wrong, Russ will lose 1% of $1,000, $1,000, of $1,000, $1, it shouldn't affect you it's much. It's not life-changing. You will complain to Wences for the idea, <laughs> but it's not like you want to kill me or anything. It's not too bad. If I am right, those four Bitcoins will be $4 million, which is 40 times your entire savings. So it's not like you will say, I wish I had bought more. No, you bought plenty. So it's so asymmetrical that to have it very little makes sense. Do not have an amount of Bitcoin that you cannot afford to lose, but have a little bit. I hope for those listening at home, this rivals our uh, uh, Gary Taub's episode that got a lot of people to stop eating carbohydrates and eat more, and consume more protein. This could, this could be his life changing. I wish Econ Talk, the knowledge was maybe more, uh, the economics knowledge was less, uh, was more practical, but this is practical. It's an interesting, it's a very interesting way to, to think about it. Um, so in regard to what you said about the deflationary nation of, notion of Bitcoin, it's something that economists in particular get wrong about Bitcoin. Bitcoin uh, was not designed to be the currency of a country. And it was designed to be private money of private individuals, by individuals, for individuals. And if you're an individual, you prefer a currency that appreciates versus a currency that depreciates. Right? If you're rational and you say, hey, what do you want to keep all your savings in something that loses value or you want to keep all your savings in that increases in value? Most rational people will choose something that increases in value, that appreciates, and therefore that is deflationary. Bitcoin should never be used by a, national, by a country as its national currency. It would be crazy, I think, because it just gives up all, uh, all ability to control the currency in any way. And... Um, Imagine, but a country. Huh? Go ahead. Imagine, for example, that some country had adopted Bitcoin a couple of years ago. It was $5 a Bitcoin. And then so someone would be making um, $50,000 a year. Uh, it would be making 10,000 Bitcoin a year. And right now that country would be immensely, inco non uh, wouldn't be able to compete, right? Because... That because the average salary needs to be $2 million a year. So it would be suicidal for a country to eliminate their currency and switch for Bitcoin. But this currency is not, a, uh, Bitcoin is not a currency for a country, it's a currency for private people. I think that when Bitcoin succeeds, it will become the currency of the internet. Today, the internet does not have a native currency and it needs it because when we're transacting on the internet, we're using currencies that are foreign to the internet, like the dollar or like the euro, the yen. They don't really, it's like trying to have a pig fly. It doesn't really fly very well. Same thing, these non-digital currencies don't perform well on the internet. But in becoming the currency of the internet, it will also likely become a global currency, a meta currency against which all currencies can be exchanged. So if someone in China is conducting commerce with someone in Kenya, they don't need to use... Today they're using the dollar, which is neither one of their currencies, and it doesn't make any sense. They, all of those things probably have to occur in Bitcoin eventually, and a lot of online transactions will have to happen in Bitcoin. Yeah, the other thing I think economists don't understand is they think deflation is inherently bad, and deflation is not inherently bad if it's expected. People knew that it was what was happening, I think it would be uh, a good thing. The other point I think to make is that uh, although it may not be any nation's currency, it puts competitive pressure on countries to treat their currency maybe better than they have in the past because there's a chance for citizens to exit. So when I was growing up in Argentina and I saw my family lose everything a few times, basically the government was taking advantage that of the poor who didn't have an alternative Correct. what to do with It's like their, their school system. Exactly. Sorry, cheap shot. Go ahead. Uh, but if you had... If your life was in cash and you had Argentine pesos, the government was taking advantage that you did, really didn't have much to do with that. If now anyone with a cell phone has an alternative, it will force those countries to be more responsible with their currency because people have an alternative and they will say, if you want me to hold your currency, if you want me to hold pesos, you better make it attractive, make be responsible because if it's not attractive, I'm going to sell them and I'm going to get something else that you don't control. And that's yeah. very happy. And, and limits, so it limits the ability of the government to exploit through money creation, which has yeah. uh, got to be a good thing. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about Zappo. Um, tell me what service it's trying to provide that's not available right now. We look at the biggest obstacles that people have to use Bitcoin and focus on those. And 
we are Sapo is like a Bitcoin bank. If you have dollars, you may keep them in a place like Bank of America. If you have Bitcoin, you need to keep them somewhere. And that's, those are the services we provide. We give you an account that looks like a bank account, but for Bitcoin, where you can keep your Bitcoin, you can receive Bitcoin, you can send Bitcoin, you can buy Bitcoin, you can sell Bitcoin. But in theory, I don't need a bank. It's different from a bank in a very important way, in which is um, when you give, when you put $100 in Bank of America, you're really giving that money to Bank of America and it is in their balance sheet. And then they turn around and they do things that you may or may not know about it with. Right? Yeah. And yeah. when you give us 100 Bitcoin, it's very, very different in that that is not in our balance sheet. We do not own it. We just safe keep those Bitcoin for you. So it's equivalent to, we look like a big parking garage, a big building that is a parking garage. The parking garage structure is ours. You bring your car and you park it there. The car is yours. We cannot use it, touch it, lease it, sell it, anything. It's not ours, right? We just provide the parking garage structure. So the, the question then is, so why don't I park it in my own driveway? Why, why do I need a third party to park my car? Is it, because part of the, the appeal of Bitcoin is that it's, I don't need this third party. So all of a sudden... I disagree with that premise. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to offend you, so I'm going to use my mom as an example. But I trust my mom, maybe more than I trust most people, right? But I do not trust my mom to keep her private key safe. That requires quite a lot of know-how and expertise. And, and I would be irresponsible if I told mom, yeah, sure, mom, get some Bitcoin and you take care of the security of those Bitcoin. That would be highly irresponsible. Just like it would be highly irresponsible to tell my mom, keep all your savings at home under the mattress. That would be Because you'll know where it is. Because huh? you'll know where it is, but yeah. it's dangerous. And some other people may too, and you know, so it's dangerous. So what we do is make it invisible for people. So they, we want you to have certainty that these Bitcoin are yours. We're just safekeeping them. So it's not like um, putting them at risk like you would in a bank. But we really go to extraordinary length to make sure that those Bitcoin are safe. Things that for most individuals and institutions are sort of unthinkable to do on their own. Okay, we're going we're gonna to talk about that. But first, I want to ask, ask an, a risk at asking a, a, an embarrassing question. It, it reminds me a little bit of America Online. So you don't know how to get on the Internet, but we have this easy way. It's, it's part of the, so there's really two things that you're trying to provide. One is I'm not a technical guy. I don't want to read the Bitcoin paper. I don't want to figure out how to establish my own account. You're going to make that effortless for me. Yeah. The second part, though, is you're going to try to make it easy for me to be to sleep well at night. Yeah. But the question then is, how, how do I it, it, to, to turn the tables on you? If you were my mom. Yeah. I'd feel good about letting you take care if you and you were really smart about about crypt, uh, cryptography and, and keys. I'd say, well, my mom's taking care of it. I've heard about it. But why Zappo's not my mom. So how do I know that Zappo is not Mount Gox? How do I know you're taking care of of my money in a way that I can rely on? And what are you doing that's different? So there are many, many ways in which you can do that. We have a, a few uh, accounts that hold more than $50 million worth of Bitcoin with us. And all of those clients will send um, teams to do due diligence of SAPO that includes a financial due diligence, a legal due diligence, a physical security, and, and cyber security, right? Uh, as you would if you were to put $50 million with anyone. And every single time that we've had one of those due diligence done to us, we've won the account. That's why we, the largest owners of Bitcoin all use SAPO, and that's what has made SAPO the largest custodian of Bitcoin in the world. But that's one indicator. Um, another one is if, if you look at who our investors are, right? You have some of the best investors in Silicon Valley, Benchmark, uh, Reid Hoffman from Greylock and LinkedIn, Index Ventures, uh, Rivet, Fortress, and... And I would suggest that the reason they invested that money is because yep. they know you. They know that we are serious, that we know, they know that we've done this before, that, that we are professionals, that we know finance, we know security. Our board of advisors is composed of D. Hawk, who was the founder of Visa, John Reed, who was the chairman of Citibank, 
and Larry Summers, who was the Secretary of the Treasury. You know, and, and if it's your mom, that those names should give her comfort that we're here for the long run, we know what we're doing, and we really want to make sure that your beacons are safe. But you also, that's all talk. It's yeah. nice. But, but let's say I'm doing the due diligence. Yeah. I, I'm not, I don't have 100 Bitcoin. I've got 100,000. 100, yeah. What, what am I going to see when I come to Zappo to do that? Due diligence. So let's talk about the physical side, because what you're doing there is extremely unusual. Yeah. So what we do is we keep the private keys of the Bitcoin that we do custody for in offline servers. These offline servers have never been online and will never be online. And that's important because it means that nobody has had ever a chance to see them and fingerprint them in any way to try to guess how this Bitcoin may create or store the private keys. So these are offline servers that have never been online and will never be online. Those servers are inside a vault, a big vault, and that vault is deep underground. Our main vault is in a military bunker under the Swiss Alps in Switzerland. And we have distributed keys in five continents. So if someone wanted to steal your private key, and if your beacons are in Sapo and someone wants to steal your private key, they need to physically break into a bunker and then into a vault in three different continents at the same time, which is very hard to do. So then the next question would be the fraud, not necessarily fraud, but you have employees that, who are guarding the bunker. Yeah. What keeps them from stealing the... There are systems that are also audited that make it so not only if you have one, but more rogue employees, that's not enough. A conspiracy. For, yeah, yeah. Uh, for them to run away with the Bitcoin, right? So um, the, the people who have access to those locations are very, very limited. There's uh, many doors inside the bunker to get to this bulk. <laughs> Each one has biometric uh, verification. All of this is being filmed. Um, and again, it's a very short list of people who can do that at each bunker. All of those are different people. They do not Know, know each other, even though the system makes it so even if they were to contact each other, they cannot collude to move the Bitcoin. So the irony is we have a currency that is magnificent because it is has low transaction costs. Mm -hmm. So right now, even if you have a credit card, yep. there's, a, there's a fee because there's a potential for fraud. The big advantage of Bitcoin is that when I have it, I know that you sent it to me. I don't have to worry that you stole somebody's credit card. I don't have to refund it when it gets called back, et cetera, et cetera. And yet now there's these additional transaction costs, of course. So the question is, how large are they going to be? These, these are very expensive physical costs to create a digital frictionless currency. It depends on how you look at it, Russ, because all of this, of course, is very expensive to build, but it's very cheap to run. Whether we process one transaction a day or 100 million transactions a day, the cost is the same, meaning the margin of transaction have to build is a, close to zero. You don't have to build a bigger bunker. Yeah. Because just the server's got exactly. a lot of space. Yeah. So it's actually quite efficient. It doesn't, it's not really costly per transaction. And what do you, will be, your costs are then are going to, per transaction, are going to fall, mm -hmm. right, over time. Yeah. So right now, what do you charge uh, to protect Bitcoin? It's, the, it's all free. Right now. To keep the Bitcoin will always be free. How do you make your money? We make money when people ask us to buy Bitcoin for them. We charge them 1%. When people ask us to sell Bitcoin for them, we charge 1%. And we issue a Bitcoin, uh, we issue a debit card that can be used anywhere credit cards are accepted. It's free to the user, just like using your debit card, your bank debit card is free to you, but the merchant pays us a little every time our customers use it. So right now, to go back to the fee, the 1%, that's for buying and selling in, my, in a particular currency. Yeah. But if I'm transferring Bitcoin, it's free. Still zero. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you've recently, how, how old is Zappo? It's about two years old. Two years old. And you recently, to a lot of fanfare, got a $20 million, or a second $20 million investment. We raised a total of $41 million, yes. And when did that come in? That second uh, one? Uh, the second one in July of last year. Okay, so about a year ago. And um, are you done? If you can yeah. talk about it? Yeah. You done. think you're, you're good going forward? Yeah, we, that was more capital than we were looking for, so we're good. You're good. So what's going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? 
You, you gave us a forecast about, oh, let me ask it differently. You said there's a chance Bitcoin won't succeed, it'll be worth a lot of money in, Amer- in regular currency. There's a chance it'll be worth zero, total failure. How will I know that it's successful? What would be a sign that it's, because one could, so you could say, we know it's successful now. Somebody gave Wences Casares $40 million. That's a pretty serious sign of success. I You've got a vault in the Swiss Alps. Uh, I think we're good. No, I think it will be successful when we see more than 200 million people owning Bitcoin. And, uh, and I see many different ways that get us there, right? Uh, it, may take, it may happen in five years or it may happen in 20 years, but there's, I can see different ways that can get us there. To give me a flavor of them. Um, I think that the most likely one is a very boring one in which nothing new happens. Just you slowly know. accumulates. We got to, from 0 to 13 million owners of Bitcoin in six years with no killer app, basically. Yeah. We just, right. everybody tells everybody, every new, if you own some Bitcoin, I can guarantee that you infected more than one person without meaning to, right? And that's true for everybody who has Bitcoin. That keeps growing. So that very boring, everybody in Silicon Valley and Wall Street is waiting for the killer app. And I think that there's a way to get there without a killer app. Just like we got to 13 million people without a killer app, this can keep growing organically to 200 million. That's one path. I see a real demand in emerging markets where billions of people have smartphones, but they cannot transact online. So that's another way to get there. Or imagine a world in which five years from now, where 200 million kids under 25 have zero to $10 in Bitcoin because they use it to, for online gaming. It's only a matter of time before we realize, like, hey, I should offer other things to these kids because that's very easy for them to transact, to pay me with it, right? So yeah. there are many ways we get there. It's going to take time, but it's going to get there. Uh, do you think we'll find out who Satoshi Nakamoto is? I think he doesn't want us to, so I hope we don't. If he doesn't want it to be known, he deserves that privacy, and we owe him all a lot. The least we can give him is his wishes, right? So I agree with that. Do you, do you want to speculate on why? There's, I can't think of a similar experience in human history where someone created something extraordinary and didn't take credit for it. Yeah. I think whenever someone tells you why Satoshi disappeared, some people will tell you that it's because he's afraid of government. Other people will tell you that's because he wants to run away with the money he has. And I think whenever some people tell you, why Satoshi disappeared is more telling of the person talking to you and their own fears than Satoshi. If you just read everything Satoshi wrote, and especially the code he wrote, and it's obvious that he was very obsessed with robustness. He made some calls that nobody makes today in technology or in finance. Whenever there was a fork in the road in front of Satoshi and something led to more efficiency and the other one led to more robustness, he always chose most robustness to a ridiculous degree. The mining... Arrangement is one example. How do you calculate the balance of the Bitcoin address is another example. But there's plenty of examples how obsessed he was with robustness. And if and a system with a father is a think WikiLeaks, it's a lot less robust than a system without a father. Think TCP/IP, right? So if you think every, what? what was the second one? Uh, the protocol that powers the internet, TCP/IP. Or, yeah. So if uh, WikiLeaks would be more powerful if it didn't have a father because a lot of people associate WikiLeaks with Julian Assange and some people may not like his hair and therefore they won't trust it and it's a pity. Uh, it's, if I have to buy something, I have to fork out money for something and if every time I'm forking out money I was thinking of a particular person, it's like I'm trusting that person. It's a lot more powerful to have something that is fatherless and I think that's why Satoshi did it and it makes sense. It takes immense discipline and a, and a very, very unique kind of character, uh, strength of character to imagine that this changes the world like I think it will, more than the internet. And imagine that Satoshi is old 40 years from now and his grandkids come and say, hey, grandpa, what did you do with your life? And he will say, oh, I was just a humble university profession or whatever he is. It's, that's incredible. That's well, that would be unusual that. because not that many there are humble, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? It would be, it, it's remarkable what he's done. And I think he did it for the better. Of, I think Bitcoin is more robust because it does, because the creator or the creators gave up the paternity. And but I, I interrupted you. So we need 40 years from now. What, what were you going to say? Imagine that 40 years from now, Satoshi's grandkids 
ask Satoshi, hey, grandpa, what did you do with your professional life? What was your contribution to this world? He actually changed the world, but he will only tell his grandkids, you know, I was just a humble university professor or whatever it is. That, that, that requires immense strength of character. Yeah. So you're saying that, that might be the end of the story. He'll go to his grave and he'll Maybe. never... If, that yeah. what he, if that's what he wants, he deserves it and it's remarkable. If he wants to come out and take the credit, he also deserves that. It's whatever he wants, right? We owe him enough. My guest today is Wences Casares. Wences, thanks for being part of Econ Thank Talk. you for coming. My pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.